Uh, so my talk uh, is entitled RSCs as Researchers, uh, a Case Study in Health Data. Um, uh, and really, this is going to be totally different from, you know, for, uh, from uh, what's happening in, for example, in the previous talk. Uh, I'm barely going to touch on what my actual research is. There'll be a couple of slides in the middle of there, really. But, uh, uh, but what, what I'm really trying to get across here is a, 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 uh, an example of RSEs working as researchers rather than alongside researchers, but as researchers in their own right. Um, so I'm Sam Cox. I'm a senior research software engineer. Um, I spent half of my time in the uh, central RSE, RSE team in the University of Nottingham, uh, and I'm also on 50% secondment to Health Data Research UK. Uh, so uh, one of my aims, really, uh, uh, and, and some caveats uh, for, for my talk. Uh, what I'd like to do is share an example of research software engineers. You're okay. Uh, I'd like to share, share an example of uh, research software engineers conducting their own funded research um, in their own right. I'd like to have a look at some of the lessons uh, that we've learned across the, uh, along the way, uh, some pros and cons for those who might be interested in doing something similar, uh, and some uh, advice. Uh, so this is really lessons from a, from a single data point. Um, uh, uh, and so I want to make it clear, we are not the only people who have done this. Uh, we've seen other examples uh, uh, through the conference uh, today already. Uh, we've also not done everything perfectly. Uh, we don't have all the answers, and this uh, isn't for everybody either. So, lots of uh, lots of caveats there. Uh, but hopefully, this can be of use uh, uh, if it's if it's of interest. Um, then then you might be able to learn something from our experience. Uh, the other thing uh, I, I really want to make uh, clear is that almost none of this is my own work. Uh, I am in a central RSE team that numbers nearly thirty people these days. Uh, uh, and so there's a lot of work from around uh, the, uh, from around that team, those that we've worked with in the university, uh, uh, in other organizations, uh, and in particular people like uh, RPIs, and I'll hopefully credit them uh, at the end uh, appropriately. What do I mean by RSEs as researchers? <coughs> uh, uh, RSEs are often viewed as explicitly not being researchers. Now, that's not the case everywhere, uh, but it can be uh, the, the case in some places. Uh, in some setups in universities, they're not allowed to bring in money, for example. Uh, they always have to pair with a researcher outside of their group. Um, this is most true probably in central RSE groups. Um, obviously, I know there are lots of RSEs who work uh, directly in research groups as well. But there are instances, and this is just one of them, uh, where by such metrics, actually, RSEs are researchers. Uh, and so that's what I'd like to present today. But as I say, n equals one. So any lessons that we can take from this, please take with a pinch of salt. And I'd really love to hear other people's uh, examples uh, and experience uh, of, of how this has gone uh, for themselves. There we are. Uh, so a little bit of uh, background as to uh, the setup of our, of our team, because I think that's quite important. Uh, so we are the central RSE team. Uh, it was founded in 2012, so quite an early uh, RSE team, really. At that time, it was a bioinformatics team of around five people. Um, I didn't join until 2019. So as I say, lots of this is not my own work. Uh, since 2012, it has regularly expanded, uh, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of remits. Uh, so now it numbers around 30, depending on exactly who you count. Um, it contains research software engineers, software engineers, bioinformaticians, data analysts, data engineers, uh, plus all of the operations staff around uh, around the team as well. So what I'm trying to demonstrate with this uh, little graphic here really is that we've gone from a small team of sort of four or five people up to this much larger one, but we're not just this uh, homogenous blob of research software engineers. There's a lot of different uh, people uh, within the group. So there's a variety of skill sets. You know, so we've got people who are uh, software engineers, who just happen to work in a university. We've got RSEs who are very much closer to the research, uh, data analysts, bioinformaticians, et cetera. Uh, along with those different skill sets, there's also different sets of uh, motivations uh, and, and, and how people want sort of, you know, career aspirations, as it were. Uh, so we have people in our group uh, who, you know, uh, uh, love software, uh, they're really not that much fussed by research. It happens to be that they're working in a research field. Uh, we've got uh, perhaps your more classic RSE somewhere in the middle on that scale, 
and then towards the end you have uh, 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 people who are in, in you know uh, very much more down the research end of things uh, but obviously have uh, technical capabilities as well so we've got a whole kind of uh, a mishmash of, of, of people and a variety of uh, motivations and skills <clears throat> Uh, now, one of the key things about our, our team is that we do not have a central budget, okay? Uh, so we, uh, our university does not uh, 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 particularly underwrite us. We have to cost recover uh, everything that we can. Uh, back in the good old days, we had a couple of uh, funded posts, but those have tapered off so that by the middle of COVID, uh, that was uh, reduced to zero. <laughs> and so uh, that comes with it certainly challenges. Uh, because we have to be able to balance the books. But we've also sort of taken the opportunity to see that actually if we've got no budget, then also nobody can tell us what we need to do, uh, uh, as long as we can find money to do it. Uh, and, and so we tr we're, we're trying to grasp that opportunity uh, in, in the best way that we can. Uh, there's been some very clever uh, sort of backroom uh, uh, deals uh, that have allowed us to be in a, nice, a nicely positioned uh, place in the university which is really key and i'll sort of touch on that a little bit later but to make this work with finance with hr etc because as always rses don't fit into anybody's nice boxes uh, in the university uh, uh, and so for the next couple of minutes what i'd like to do is just demonstrate uh, 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 one of our work streams which is in health data i'm really only going to give a very brief uh, uh, overview of, of what that looks like but hopefully then uh, we can extract some lessons from that as well. So really, uh, uh, rather than having to uh, rely on everybody else for funding, we can bring in funding ourselves. So uh, some very fancy graphics on this slide. Um, so we, we begin it back in about 2016, I'm going to say. Um, uh, this is where our case study starts. So this is in the world of biobanking. So the UK has roughly 300 uh, biobanks, I believe. These hold human tissue samples. Uh, now, if you're a researcher and you want to uh, find human tissue samples, how are you going to find them? Uh, and the answer is uh, on the left, you're going to go to each of them in turn and ask them, do you have samples that match the criteria that I need? Um, uh, and that had been up until that point, essentially the only way that you could do it. Obviously, there are lots of problems with that. Uh, asking such a query doesn't take a, doesn't take a couple of minutes. It might take weeks of work, um, and so repeats times three hundred uh, until you've worked out who has the samples that you need. Uh, so the team got uh, a, a grant to work on the uh, tissue direct tissue directory coordination center (TDCC) um, and uh, uh, could could build this tool um, uh, for uh, for uh, data discovery. Uh, so on the right hand side, that just tries to illustrate uh, for those that aren't uh, aren't uh, in the world of federated discovery what that looks like. But that allows the researcher to talk to a single point, which could then send out queries to all of the different biobanks, asking, "Do you have the data that I need?" Uh, and an answer returns automatically. Uh, and so this this is a, a system that was built. Uh, from about 2017 to about 2019. And we partnered with a company called BC Platforms who had some uh, 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 nice uh, software uh, that could uh, do exactly this. Uh, it's kind of a different, uh, a different topic, uh, but we did have a nice uh, collab and continue to have a good collaborative work, um, uh, arrangement with them. We didn't just buy their software uh, and install it, but instead actually we've been uh, working really, uh, uh, really uh, hand in hand with them for a number of years now, and that's been beneficial for everybody. So that happened in about 27, 2018, 2019. Oh. Um, along came COVID, uh, and uh, with it uh, came uh, new funding opportunities for those uh, who wanted it. So in 2020, a lot of money was made uh, available very quickly. Uh, for pretty much anything in the health data infrastructure uh, sphere. Uh, and this is a, a pro uh, project that uh, I worked on, several other people in the room uh, worked on, uh, called CoConnect. <coughs> uh, now, the, the aim of this system uh, uh, is uh, to make data sets for COVID uh, uh, available in a very similar way. So this federated discovery uh, idea or cohort discovery uh, idea. 
Uh, and so actually, uh, although this looks kind of slightly different, and if you want to talk about OMOP and all things health data, then uh, uh, feel free, but I'm, I'm really not going to touch on it. Uh, but we were able to take the infrastructure from our previous slide uh, uh, and, uh, and turn it into this. Uh, now, it, that sounds like an afternoon's work. Actually, it was about two years' worth of work for, uh, for, for a large group of people. But in the end, we have a system that allows us to do federated discovery of uh, 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 data sets for uh, COVID data uh, across the UK. It's been very successful. Uh, I think we have 19 data partners and 50-something uh, data sets off the top of my head. So uh, researchers using the system can now access records relating to over 10 million people uh, in the UK. Uh, but really the key is we took uh, our original system uh, and, and we built something uh, that built upon that knowledge within the team and the expertise that we had. Uh, and really, uh, that's what continues to happen to, uh, to, uh, today. Uh, so we now have a project called Terrifics uh, on the right-hand side there, uh, which is again looking at uh, beyond federated discovery. There's now federated analytics, so sending out uh, 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 more advanced queries uh, to, to uh, uh, ping back answers from multiple locations. Uh, and this can be used on health data or other sensitive data. So if you're, if you're in the trusted research environments world, uh, then uh, that's very much in there. Uh, and so we have a, a stack called Hutch that we're building uh, on that. And uh, uh, as it stands, we're also continuing to uh, uh, look for more funding to you know uh, continue this journey. But the point I really want to make is that these haven't been just completely separate things, but each step along the way has been building capabilities uh, and building capacity. Uh, and this has been uh, very, very good to our team in Nottingham. Uh, and I want to make uh, make it clear, because I don't think I was clear, that, that uh, particularly CoConnect uh, and Trivix are not, not Nottingham only uh, endeavors. Uh, we've got lots of, uh, lots of partners. So hopefully that was just a uh, just set, set the scene a little bit really in terms of what is it uh, that we've been that we've been working on, what's the kind of uh, projects that we've had, uh, and, and and really the interesting and important point is that we were doing that as researchers in our own right. So uh, 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 PIs of those projects have been the head of our department, uh, the, the head of our of our um, RSE service, for example, uh, and others. We've had co-eyes within the group uh, as well. Uh, so we've not had to partner with a researcher in School of Medicine in the university, for example. Uh, we instead can bring the money directly into our team. So just to reflect on that, and as I said, this is, this is one data point. There'll be uh, many other examples as well, uh, but I just wanted to share what I think we've learned from uh, uh, our, our time doing this, and the good news is we are continuing to do this. Uh, so in terms of benefits, uh, from a kind of RSE perspective, uh, uh, what are the benefits for our team and for the people in it? First of all, uh, it has led to interesting work. And now, as I said, there's a whole variety of different people in our, uh, in our group. Not everybody in our group is involved in these particular work streams. Uh, but for those who are, um, they do tend to be uh, finding uh, this this work to be interesting, uh, and the fact that we're not paired with other people who you know outside they're the researcher calling the shots outside of the team makes uh, makes sure that people you know feel like they have autonomy, like they have input into the research itself, rather than having to go through a researcher elsewhere. Uh, this um, has uh, allowed us to offer also a range of career and work options to our uh, to uh, the people in our group. So what do I mean by that? Well. Um, uh, because our group uh, is kind of working throughout the project life cycle, so it's working all the way from the you know the conception of the idea, proposal stage, uh, uh, imp implementation, right up, uh, and next steps. All of that can happen within our team. As I say, it's not only our team, but uh, uh, we have lots of partners as well. But, but because all of that can happen within our team, what it means is uh, that our RSEs and uh, the people in the team. Get the, get the chance to work on all of those different stages if that's of interest, interest to them. Uh, it means that you don't have to, uh, if you'd like some publications, it means you don't have to step outside of our team uh, and go and work in School of Medicine uh, if, if you want to do uh, this kind of thing or wherever it might be. You can stay within the team uh, and uh, uh, contribute that way. 
Um, so I've put a question mark against retention because I've got zero data to bank this up. But my but my feeling is actually this helps with the retention uh, in in our team as well because people find it interesting and they don't think well I've got I'd like to do X I'm going to have to uh, uh, step across the road into the other building to be able to ever do that. They can continue to work in our team uh, and uh, and uh, uh, stay in those positions. Um, that's helpful in terms of just uh, keeping the knowledge within our uh, group that they've built up, but also it means that they can also feed back in that knowledge, that understanding of how research works continues, you know, to, to keep being fed into, into the group. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, being able to do this means we can div diversify our funding streams. So as I said, we're a cost recovered service. We do have to cover our costs. Um, and this is one way of doing that. So we do have uh, plenty uh, of work, thank you, uh, uh, from other researchers around the university, but uh, doing this means that we can also bring in money in our own right. Uh, so that's actually just really helpful. It means we can be more picky about exactly what, uh, 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 what projects we, we work on. Um, uh, and uh, of course, if we're not successful in bringing in money in our own rights, then we can go back out to researchers in the university. Um, so it, you know, it, it just gives us, that, gives us that flexibility. It's another funding stream uh, that doesn't rely on having those same experts, but somewhere else in the university. So those are all, those are all kind of positives, I would say, uh, from, from this way of, of working. But you know, uh, it's, a, it, it's not all one way. Um, here are some of the things that, you know, that I think we've learned and, and things that, uh, if you are considering doing this, you need to understand uh, as well. So there are all those benefits that I've highlighted uh, a moment ago. I think, you know, if you're thinking of that you'd like to work in this kind of way, then like focus on the benefits definitely, because we have really uh, uh, enjoyed and it's been very successful for us. But also here's some, uh, some things that we've thought about. So first of all, uh, if you want to work in the research world and you want to do your own funded research, that does mean going out and getting funding. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, we've we, we've been able to uh, um, continue to, to work, of course, with with researchers around the university. So we don't have to do this all the time. Uh, but if we do want to work on our own stuff, then we do have to chase our own funding. So if that's not something that uh, that you can bear, um, uh, then that's fine. Uh, uh, one of the things we've really learned is how much larger projects uh, provide stability. Um, so things like the Coconut Project, for example, are, have been massively helpful in, uh, in sort of just greasing the wheels and allowing us the time uh, to focus on, on, on doing a good job and thinking strategically about what our next steps are. Um, otherwise, we're, we're constantly chasing the next uh, piece of funding every three months. Uh, uh, costings. Uh, but if you're if you're in this world, you you uh, rather than just farming out all the worry about the costs and things to researchers, uh, th those problems are now your problems. So you have to understand how costings work. Uh, if that's not something that, that, that you've done, then beware they are very uh, complex. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have uh, 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 members of our team who who work in operations are able to, uh, to to spend the time that's required to really understand that. But that's been really a hard one. Uh, uh, knowledge in our team. Uh, what I would say is there are an awful lot of ways to work on funded research and to lose money. Um, and we've probably been burned by pretty much every one of them so far. Um, there are different funding councils will give you, uh, will fund a different amount of your time, whether that's 80% or 100%. Um, uh, they may pay overheads, they may not. They may pay margin, they may not. Uh, they may or may not fund uh, uh, for supervision or for operations. Uh, so there are all these different ways that you can think that you've uh, costed your time effectively, uh, and then it turns out that you, that you hadn't budgeted enough. Um, but the good news is there will be people in your university who do know how to do this. Uh, for us, it's uh, research and innovation. They have people whose job it is, thank you, to, uh, to know what, uh, what all these rules are. So my advice would be go and talk to them. We probably didn't talk to them enough. Uh, uh, initially, we've had to, had to learn the hard way, uh, but there are people out there that, that, that do know that. Uh, as I said, we've got a diversity of people within our team, a whole host of different motivations. Some people love the research side, other people just happen to work in the university. Um, and for some people, 
you know, the real reason why they became an ROC, or one of the main reasons, was because they did not want to be a researcher. They did not want the, you know, the chaos of uh, of constantly chasing uh, funding. So, what I would say is, work out who those people in are, who who those people are in your team. Who is it that actually wants to work in this kind of way, and who can do, um, and who's just going to run screaming uh, uh, the, the minute that, that you mention that they might have to put in a proposal for something. Work out who they are, and you uh, try and try and work with that because it's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, and, and finally, uh, <laughs> this is not a silver bullet. So, you know, we've uh, enjoyed what we're doing. We get to work on research that's interesting to us. It provides us flexibility and uh, all those different things, but it's not a silver bullet, right? Uh, we've still got many of the issues that, that, we, uh, that, that we all have. For example, uh, software sustainability in terms of uh, financial uh, sustainability. We still uh, uh, work funding pot to funding pot, uh, when when the money runs out, we have to sort of sit there staring at our lovely GitHub repo, saying, "When will I ever work on you again?" Um, and and you know, so this this hasn't solved that for us, uh, sadly. So, thank you very much for, for 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 listening to me. Hopefully, that's been of interest and of use potentially. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me about any of uh, of this, I'm uh, more than happy to talk about it. But hopefully, it's been just kind of an interesting insight into how one team has done this kind of work. Uh, I'm sure others will have done things totally differently uh, and other people will not be at all interested in doing so. Um, uh, it just leaves me to thank uh, a, a large number of people. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. Uh, First of all, uh, our uh, sort of uh, director of, uh, of our digital research service. So he's the head of the ROC team, or was until about two weeks ago. Was Phil Quinlan, uh, and he's been the main PI for most of this of this uh, uh, work stream in, in health data, uh, uh, and the rest of the digital research service, which is the ROC team. Uh, a whole host of people have worked on all of these different projects. Uh, uh, CoConnect, uh, Emily Jefferson. Uh, in, in particular, who's another PI on that, uh, and, and all of the partner organizations, particularly uh, HIC at the University of Dundee. Uh, uh, when the slides go around, if you want to follow any of these links, then you can do meet the people who are on the, on the CoConnect team. Uh, UK uh, CRC Tissue Directory Coordination Centre, Health Data Research UK, uh, DARE UK, who are funding the Terrifics program, uh, and BC Platforms, who uh, uh, built that original software. So uh, 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 thank you to, to all of those, uh, and my contact details are, are down here, but thank you very much for listening to me, and please do come and uh, uh, chat to me about your experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but you're not off the hook yet because uh, you have some questions. Um, so the first question, uh, sorry if I missed this, but where exactly did the funding for these projects in your groups come from? Is it possible that those funding sources aren't as readily available in domains outside health data? Uh, sure, yeah. So most of this has come through um, MRC and the uh, Health Data Research UK, um, but not exclusively. Um, so uh, they are they are readily available to anybody in the UK. So it's. Uh, I think entirely that I can think of come through those. Um, so uh, MRC, HDI UK, and then the DARE um, uh, uh, driver programs. Uh, I guess the question arrived before your final slide. Uh, probably, yeah. yeah. Um, as the team isn't underwritten, are members of the RSC uh, team employed on fixed term contracts? Uh, excellent question. Uh, so we've made use of kind of uh, our fixed term contracts a fair amount. Uh, but we do have a uh, quite a number, probably, I'm going to say 10, but I may be uh, uh, well out, but uh, 10 members who are on permanent contracts. The way we've been able to do this is uh, kind of gradually over time, we work with finance to say, well, okay, look at our track record. We've got this number of people. Uh, we think that we can, uh, uh, that it's reasonable that we can continue to maintain these number of people. So we normally have uh, a, a portion that are fixed term contracts, uh, and then ideally they then get converted into permanent contracts over time. It's not really my uh, my area of expertise, but that's uh, that's just to give a flavour of um, of where we're at. Yep. Um, it sounds like you and the others in your team have a lot of autonomy with regards to research direction and funding and finding funding funding finding. How does this fit in with the management structure of your team? And does anyone mm -hmm. have the option of going after their own projects? 
Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I'd say in theory, yes. Um, and anybody has the option to, to do that. There's always a difficulty of how do you fund that time to write the proposals um, and, uh, and and more junior colleagues, you know, how, how do you how do you mentor them to do that? Uh, I don't think we've had a, a very good or no. Uh, I, I, I think there's lots of uh, uh, work we could do to improve that around the team. So we've been quite heavily reliant on probably two or three individuals for most of our uh, funding so far. In theory, yes, anybody can go for that. Uh, what we are in terms of how that fits with the management structure. Uh, so we have kind of uh, standard RSEs, senior RSC, and then sort of head of. Um, uh, I'm, I'm calling everyone on an RSC. Um, not everyone really is an RSC. Um, uh, and those PIs, I think, have always been uh, senior or head of, uh, but there's nothing to stop that. And what we would say is actually one of the ways that people can progress from a standard to a senior is if they get a funded proposal and they're costing themselves in as a senior, then congratulations. I'll, we'll pay you a senior wage. You know. um, we don't really have time particularly, but maybe we'll just uh, encroach on everyone's uh, appetite. Your laptop. Uh, um, so, how interested to hear how funding proposals went without having a proper researcher quotes as the primary PI. So, if you have a, a reflection on that or something. Um, yeah. Uh, um, probably talk to the PIs uh, for their experience would probably be my um, my main thing. I would say everybody who has been a PI does have some researcher background. I don't think anybody has come in from the cold, as it were. Um, so, um, uh, but you probably talk to the PIs directly to get there, to get the unglossed version of, of how that went. Uh, but you know, um, there's, uh, as always, uh, in, in uh, funding, there's plenty of heartbreak as well as any successes. 